we start the session by saying welcome to Lars Tregod, who will be with us on the screen to talk about Sweden's trajectory from moral superpower to cynical realpolitik. Very nice to have you here. It was possible for you to be with us. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I've been <clears throat> part of these um, images of Sweden endeavor um, for quite a while. And uh, I think one of the really great things about the fact that the project has been going on for quite a long time now is that you, uh, especially for me as an historian, you start to kind of get this uh, longer perspective and on, on these changes. So my theme today um, is going to be about the identity crisis that I think perhaps uh, is, is visible both within Sweden and in the eyes of, of foreign observers of Sweden, they are uh, often quite confused about the state of Sweden uh, today. And it's perhaps fitting that I'm sitting here talking to you from Austin, Texas, since during the pandemic, certainly Sweden was uh, sometimes portrayed, you know, as a kind of Scandinavian version of Texas uh, in our more libertarian approach to uh, dealing with the pandemic. Um, now, there are it is a kind of a overall, I think, tendency here that I will talk more specifically about, which we could, in a crude kind of term, describe as a, uh, a Swedish identity that has moved, you know, from left to to right in a sense. Uh, uh, starting like when I first came to the U.S. in 1970, it was all about uh, you know social socialism, social democracy, uh, sort of a Sweden as a you know, the right wing or left wing rather uh, dreamland and towards a situation today where gradually, I think, uh, Sweden has been viewed uh, more in a more complex way, uh, experimenting with different types of liberal reforms. Uh, and then uh, today uh, turning, you know, uh, in, in sort of context, both of the Ukraine war, but also uh, the consequences of, of uh, Swedish migration and integration policies, uh, the, the whole situation with that, I think uh, uh, we're going to hear much more about it in uh, subsequent speakers on this panel. Um, the Sweden sort of becomes known as a home for um, violence, uh, gang violence, uh, uh, crime, and so forth, murders, and, and etc. And so there's been a kind of a shift in perspectives to the left, to the right. So this early emphasis on Sweden as a good society uh, in all regards, both at home and, and abroad, towards now being more focused on, on the art politique, you know, uh, getting chuck with crime, joining NATO, and so forth, uh, it sort of forms a kind of, 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 of arch, you know, of, of development. And um, now, if we look at specific um, aspects of this uh, this change, I've sort of alluded to them already a little bit, but but but, but let me just list the four. I mean, they are perhaps not all all of the ones that we want to talk about, but they are they are significant in, in all of these. One are the reforms, the neoliberal, we can call them more liberal reforms of the entire welfare system that has, of course, been uh, discussed before in, in, in the context that we're in right now, right? The liberalization of, of uh, the introduction of school vouchers, uh, introduction of free choice in on, on various sectors of the welfare state uh, represented a kind of radical break, you know, from exclusive uh, monopolies uh, over welfare production. Um, so, so that that was already there, something that kind of started to shift. I think the image of Sweden, um, and then more recently, uh, we've had these two two kind of major uh, crises. Really, one uh, is, is one that re relates to immigration, starting uh, in primarily or most dramatically, perhaps in fall of 2015, where uh, Sweden as a moral superpower kind of reached its uh, sort of high point, right, in in the standing out long, perhaps with Germany as a country that received the largest numbers of uh, migrants and particularly refugee migrants. And um, that, of course, was consistent with this idea of Sweden as a moral superpower. And um, there's a huge investments that has been made in that regard. Um, at, um, at the same time, that, you know, produced unattended 
consequences, at least for, for many people. That is to say, the crisis that we're in now with respect, not just simply to gang violence. I think that's important. Of course, murders are extremely visible and, and highly dramatic examples of a break with the social contract. But what we see, which I would say is more disturbing, really, uh, is the tendency towards welfare crime and, and corruption and cheating uh, that hits at the very heart of the social contract, that is to say, citizens that work, pay taxes, uh, and receive their rights. And then those types of crimes are sort of operating at the very heart of the social contract. And then finally, we have then the, the two events that I mentioned briefly, also the pandemic response that, again, seem to illustrate the shift in power relations between the state and the individual in Sweden in a very interesting way. Sweden stood out in that uh, the, the idea here was that the state shouldn't just simply be trusted by its citizens, but the state should also be able to trust its citizens uh, to take responsibility, uh, make decisions about their health, be responsible, treat their citizens as, as adults, right, rather than children, which was kind of a new approach between the ratio between the state and the individual, as we one might argue. So the pandemic response itself, right, then, then shook up the image of Sweden abroad. Uh, some people, of course, wedded to a more paternalist tradition, hated it. Uh, as we know, it's highly criticized for this, but on the right, not least in the U.S., but also around Europe, many people were applauding this more libertarian welfare state that unexpectedly exploded upon the international scene uh, during this period. And that, of course, is more even more relevant today when a lot of um, indications are that the Swedish response actually was perhaps not so such a bad idea uh, if we look just at outcomes. Uh, and I won't go into any details on that. Um, then the, the last thing, of course, is this application to membership in NATO, which in, in many ways is also a very dramatic uh, break uh, with the, the traditions that uh, we've seen uh, in, in Sweden. Um, uh, so then we may then ask a few questions about what is actually then sort of going on here in Sweden. You know, I mean, as an historian, I'm, I'm not interested just in sort of the the immediate contemporary expressions of a kind of identity crisis, but like, how are we to understand this? And I think that one I sort of briefly mentioned, and you can discuss that more, is the possibility that we've seen a sort of recalibration between the relation between the state and the individual. I mean, this is something I've written a lot about, you know, about the idea of this alliance between state and individual in Sweden, this a curious paradox of hyper society that maximizes individual freedom. But I think it's also true that it's been a recalibration of the power relationship. And the pandemic response, I think, is perhaps a, a most obvious example of that, but also the reforms in the welfare sector right, that shifted some of the power away from the state uh, towards the individual. So that, that has been one under, you know, underlying secular trend during this period. Um, and the, the other one has been this uh, a tension between Sweden as a national welfare state on the one hand and a moral superpower on a global scene on the other or put it differently between nationalism and internationalism uh between nationalism and globalism right to use some of these words that's been being bandied about now and for many many years um and then um, i'll say something a little bit more about that um, uh, in my final comments um and um then we also then see this, what I mentioned before, a turn towards more realpolitik, right? And here we see this in different areas. Uh, now, I just, you know, point out to you domestically, internationally, right? So that we're seeing a shift now quite suddenly, right, away from uh, an idea of Sweden being neutral or unallied. Uh, which was a way, right, to retain, right, the purity, right, or the moral purity of the Swedish position on the world scene, right? We were engaged uh, in peace negotiations. We were not, you know, devoted to preparing ourselves for war, right? Um, but we've seen it now also in the domestic scene. This is a very even much worse and much more tortured debate in Sweden. Uh, what to do, you know, when citizens uh, and residents commit crimes and kill each other? Um, there are no self-evident answers. A lot of criminologists are up in arms about uh, uh, more harsh forms, right, of uh, uh, policies because they are wedded, right, to the idea 
that many of these uh, uh, criminals are in fact victims of different sorts, right? For for the being at the disadvantaged part of society and so forth, maybe being discriminated against, being poor, and so forth and so on. So to move towards a tougher regime, right, in the sort of spirit of realpolitik is not unproblematic, right? And it certainly also shakes up the international image of Sweden in this regard. Then, you know, in order to try to um, sort of understand the, the kind of underlying tension here that we see that is still unresolved and in some sense still not, I think, thoroughly debated in, in Sweden and certainly not uh, understood very properly uh, abroad, which is this uh, tension or collision between two Swedish models, two images of Sweden, if you so will, right? The one which is, a, is the, uh, the one that has defined life within Sweden itself yeah, is the one that we used to call the people's home, right? Uh, that is to say, that is a social contract very, very much, right? Centered on both the state and the nation, right? So the state, you know, as our set of institutions that provide uh, various types of, of uh, civil and social rights. Um, and on the other hand, nation, you know, as some idea of community, right, where you actually feel that you have a common we. Right? Now, that was very central, right, to, to the way modern Sweden was built up. And underneath that was a very strong moral code, in fact. Uh, Sweden, we refer to the some uh, the wholesome worker, someone who is a an honest, hardworking person, you know, prone to you know being serious and not excessively uh, involved with with more kind of entertaining aspects of life, uh, reliable in all ways. And this worker, right, was indeed working. Uh, in fact, work was both a right but also a duty, right. Uh, and along with the duties came then paying taxes, and only after that, so to speak, uh, did you then gain the right to claim all of the rights that we associate with welfare state. This is a very strong moral contract, and what I see in my own research, my own trust research, is that these values right, that emphasize honesty, reliability, and so forth, spread some here in Swedish, are still embraced by the vast majority of Swedes. There is very, very, I would say, little right, acceptance of cheating with respect to the welfare state. Um, now, the other uh, Swedish model then was that of the more superpower, which emerges in parallel to some extent, although it comes a little later, right, in the wake of the Second World War, Swedish sense of guilt and shame around its behavior during the Second World War. Uh, starting then with Art Hammarskjöld, you know, who became sort of an icon, right, for promoting this new role for Sweden in the global scene. Um, he himself, a Christian, uh, a, a, a believer for whom, you know, human rights was very much built on the notion of every, every human is equal in the eyes of God. Uh, so human rights, really, we should view as a kind of a secular version here, right, of a certain type of, of religious view of of men in general, uh, the humans in general. Right? Um, now, this for a long time was not a big problem, I would say, in Sweden. We had this idea, we would do good things in Sweden, so we create a welfare state. We want to do good things on the global scene as well, so we become engaged in, in you know, different types of policies related to human rights development, you know, the 1% goal as far as contributing to the international development uh, the industry. Uh, now, because they, this was occurred to different geographical spaces, uh, nobody really noticed very well the fact that these were built on two different moral codes or logics. In the one case, that everybody contributes. The other one, though, was based on the notion of charity. Uh, and this all came to a head once the moral superpower, so to speak, enters into Swedish geographical space where these two logics and sort of two systems, sort of bookkeeping, if you will, uh, collide. And that is what we are experiencing today also as a great deal of political confusion about how to deal with right, integration in Sweden, how to negotiate this tension between the moral superpower and the people's home. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Lars.
Lars, has this changing image of Sweden from socialism to liberalism attracted more attention than usual? Well, uh, I mean, one might say it's it's a very confused situation, right? Because as I noted, right, you know, it depends on what you're focusing on. I mean, during the pandemic, of course, right, that this kind of libertarian welfare state that, you know, became super interesting, of course, both to, to people who are critical and those who, who thought it was a, a, a good move. Today, though, it's all complicated by uh, the application to NATO and to the current sort of uh, situation in Sweden with respect to, to gang violence and crime in general. So it's complicated. I, I, I think confusion is probably a better word to describe the way most foreign observers you know, look at Sweden. Right? Of course, most people, as we talked about in the break here, don't know that much about Sweden to begin with. So it's not a very deep understanding at the popular level. But among experts, I think... It's a very confusing time to try to say something uh, coherent about the image of Sweden. Do some politicians as well refer to Sweden? Well, I mean, I, I, I would say that uh, what we've seen now, you know, if I was just in Norway, right? you know, I realized that maybe they don't qualify quite so exotically as foreigners, but it was very interesting there. I was there on discussion on trust and the pandemic. And certainly now they have a very different way of looking at what happened in Sweden during that phase than they did during the first wave, right? Um, and I think, you know, with respect, I think we're going to hear more from Nelson Fraser in a minute, right? Yeah. Where, you know, the vision, the idea of Sweden now is a haven for, for a crime and murder, yeah. obviously also alters things. So, you know, you see politicians reacting to different parts, right, of developments in Sweden over, over the, the, these recent past. Thank you, Lars. Let's listen to what Fraser Nelson has to say on this topic. Stay with us. Fraser, please welcome. Thank you. It's great to be um, back here in Engelsberg. I've been, um, I have a Swedish wife. I've been traveling to Sweden for about 20 years. And um, I always try to, every time I come, try to understand a little bit more about the Swedish character and society. Um, and I always feel as if I can't quite get to the, to, the, to, the, to the nub of it. And I didn't know why until I worked it earlier on. I'm a Catholic. Yeah. Right? <laughs> And now I, had, until you know, um, Svante was giving us this earlier. I, I just didn't realize this. There was a fundamentally, this is a Mars and Venus sort of thing, you know. So I, I am now uh, aware. Although I have to say, I, I've heard lots of things about Catholics in my time, but we don't take sex seriously. Now, <laughs> I, I cannot wait to hear the difference between Swedish and Catholic approaches to sex, Svante. So I think we should have a, a whole Engelsberg seminar on that, actually. <laughs> Work out each each religion and faith now. So anyway, so it is is it great the, the, the things you learn in Engelsberg. It's it's amazing. Um, I, I think um, I, I remember being um, I, I did um, these. I think this is the third or fourth images of Sweden things that I've um, I've come along to. The first one I did was about ten years ago, where I think the the text was about blondes and ABBA and stuff, which I thought was a bit cliched at, at the time. Um, because 10 years ago, of course, Sweden had become a lodestar for left and right in Britain. The Labour Party liked it for its um, high taxes and low inequality. The Tories liked the involvement of um, private companies and public services. And Sweden has gone on to inspire um, policy makers in all sorts of, in all sorts of ways. Um, we had also uh, everything from the, the, the cultural juggernaut of, of the Nordic noir. Um, and then, of course, with the wave of migration in 2014, we saw something kind of rather new now. Sweden was beginning to demonstrably bite off more than it could chew, with results that were really quite spectacular. Now, um, it's very interesting as well to see that research from the Swedish council earlier and what, what people know and like about Sweden. Um, like any modern editor now, we know what interests our readers with in seconds because we put it online and we can know within literally under a minute if something is small, big or absolutely huge. 
And I have to say that what's happening in Sweden, the problems of crime and migration, is absolutely huge. Every time we run a story like this, it's the most read story all week. We've run out of cover stories from Tove and Polina, both here today, and they're you know, one of the best read stories of the year. Now, this isn't, it's important to say it, like, like a couple of things. This doesn't, nobody's thinking Sweden is a great big national dumpster fire. Nobody thinks it's gone to the dogs. This is, uh, it's fascinating because it is such a contrast. And it is, of course, the stories in themselves are jaw-dropping, but it also raises philosophical questions. Is this happening? Is this a snake crawling into the, the Eden of Sweden? Or is this a crime problem that's reduced because Sweden is so liberal that it has now lost the equipment need to deal with a new sort of, of crime. Um, and um, uh, what really struck me, I've been following this for, for a long time. We've been writing about you know, the unaccompanied children, about the various problems of integration, about the problems of Malmo. But what really made me sit upright was listening to the, a speech by your prime minister just before Christmas, where he was saying that there are now, there are now more, I think he was saying that there are now more people killed by guns in Solentuna than there were in all of London. Now, London's got a population bigger than Sweden. Solentuna is a small Stockholm commuter town. How can this possibly be the case? And I thought he was wrong, and I commissioned my researchers to find it out, and right enough, they came back with this. So this was something I thought was keeping abreast of Swedish affairs. Um, but So then I started, and I, a, a habit which I've now got, of, of reading Sven Stagblaget uh, every day. It is, I'm always drawn by this little good morning coffee cup, which always puts me in such a good mood um, for the morning. Uh, but also, my God, the story is unbelievable. To British eyes, we, we just cannot believe our eyes that these things are relatively down page. A pensioner had 25 bullet holes in his door. Turns out it was a 14-year-old who got the wrong address. Next story. You're like, what? 14-year-old, gun, what, what? And it was like, yeah, the police arrested the 14-year-old, but they let him go because, hey, he's 14. I was like, what? That guy's got a loaded Kalashnikov. You, do, you just let him go? You know, and thus it continues. Um, I mean, it, it, is, it is unbelievable on so many levels. Um, like, and I'll, I'll give you, um, uh, and uh, I made a little list of, um, of headlines to say to the sort of thing which, you know, which my readers just cannot quite bring themselves to believe. Um, so this is a selection of um, headlines I've, I've got on my iPhone. Um, one of them is that there are 1,200 child crooks in Stockholm alone, 1,200. That this relatively small city, and let's face it, it's a small city, supports 55 criminal gangs. I mean, yeah, how many drugs are you guys taking, really? I don't know. <laughs> um, it's, um, but, I mean, and, and thus it goes, it goes like, well, where else do we have? I've got these, these are all things which, you know, my readers are, right, um, that three in four gangland crimes go unpunished. That's a pretty high rate. That solving rate of gangland murders is half that of ordinary murders, with some pretty high-profile cases going unpunished. That, um, and that and anyone arrested between the age of 15 and 21 gets a reduced sentence because they're young. I was talking to a politician today, he's saying, you know, we're, we've got this new, um, this new system now, we're really getting tough on it. We're going to start sentencing 18-year-olds the same as adults. And I was like, well, as opposed to what? And then he had to explain to me that, you know, that they get this discount. And again, these are things which, I th as soon as I think I've understood this, and I see a whole new level of, um, I'm not quite sure what to call it, but it is certainly interesting. Um, I, I mean, um, and only yesterday, this phrase is yesterday I heard a phrase from a teacher, but I'd never heard this before, that the kids will say to him, um, yo can presta fira, like, I can take four on the chest. Um, meaning I can use, I don't know why I'm telling you guys this, you all know this. I'm just saying to my British ears, this is unbelievable. You've got kids boasting about the fact that even if I murder you, my teacher, all they can do is put me in jail for four years. And that's, you know, less time than I could take a university degree. But this being Stockholm, I could probably do the degree while I'm in prison. <laughs> and, um, you know, it is simply unbelievable. And all of a sudden it becomes, oh, to us it's not particularly surprising that these conditions have bred the circumstances for gangland crime. Because I'm not sure there's a place in the world, let alone Europe, for which the risk-reward ratio for a teenager wanting to get involved in gangland crime is more attractive than it is here in Sweden. 
So I've been trying to go into the, um, you know, the, the, the mystery of, of this. And by the way, my other interest is that my wife herself is, the, she comes from a, a refugee family. They came here fledging the Soviets in 1968. So I've been very struck by, you know, the successes of Sweden in integration, not just the failures. Every time I come here, I'm actually more uh, impressed um, by the way that you guys do succeed in kind of Swedifying so many people of different um, colors and uh, r r religious backgrounds. Um, but so uh, my, my starting point is how, is, how this self-proclaimed humanitarian superpower, which has been so good over the years, uh, integrating people, all of a sudden lost its touch with calamitous consequences. Um, so this is, um, you know, it's a, and so when you are trying to understand this, it's not as if this is a new element to, this, to the Swedish image. It doesn't erase the others, it's just a new one. And it's a new world with strange characters. You can't work out... There's that, um, I don't know if anybody's seen the film um, Bugsy Malone, 70s film, where all the kids are like criminals. So there's an element of that, plus narcos, but set in Stockholm, and with characters like names like out of a Batman film, like you've got the, the Greek, the Kurdish fox. <laughs> you know? It is all, you know, and the thing is, it's um, so, shall I say, fascinating. And, um, and I've spent the last few days going over to meet some people, former policemen, politicians, social workers, teachers, to try to understand it, to work out what's going on. I noticed that it's pretty difficult to no notice what's going on if you read criminologists. Every time I try to find an interview, I, I've, that's the first thing I do. You look for some scientific research, you look for some figures, somebody must have done some studies on this. And then you find out that in 2017, the Justice Minister banned the collection of um, studies with ethnicity and crime. Now that is unbelievably daft. I mean, in the UK, you've got all sorts of data on ethnicity and crime, ethnicity and poverty. And when somebody checks into a hospital in Britain, you get their address, which tells you the deprivation or not. You get, if you get, if you get in there for a knife crime, you get your ethnicity. And these things, rather than being somehow an extension of racism, they're the opposite of racism. Because when you collect this data, you go beyond this strange kind of white versus non-white dichotomy of seeing the world. And we all know that... Um, that for, in Britain, for example, one of the things that we found by Kemi Baden, who was here at M Engelsberg last year, she, um, as a qualities minister, has commissioned so much information about ethnicity to show that, for example, black Africans do better than whites who do better than black Caribbeans. If you're from an Indian background in Britain, you tend to do better than whites who do better than the um, um, those from Pakistani and Bangladeshi backgrounds. Chinese, pretty much better than everybody. The ethnic group least likely to get into university in Britain are poor white men. The point is that there are so many differences between ethnic groups that to lump them all as being white and non-white is to willfully not begin to look at the kind of problems that you're in here. And it's not just, I mean, uh, whether, like, either, even um, differences between Afghans and um, between the cohorts, between what year you arrived. Um, and all of these things, if, you, if you're not really studying them, if you're not gathering data, then you're not really understanding the, um, the, the, the problem. Um, I've also noticed that there's also, I found out the other day, there's even a, I mean, journalists are given a code of conduct where they're discouraged from mentioning the ethnicity. Um, unless it's, um, so, you know, you can't emphasize the ethnic origin or nationality of um, somebody um, unless it's um, deemed necessary. Of course, you know, that's very pejorative what is necessary. So basically, even journalists are being warned off anything which might try to help promote the public discussion. You end up with this famous Swedish opinion corridor being policed in a way that academics aren't going to go into an area that they might not like, and journalists are basically be being warned to stay away from it, uh, leaving a very intellectually unexplored. And in some ways, you can see the intellectual conditions here for this problem to emerge. It's never going to be solved if people aren't going to look closely at that problem. Now, um, I was... Um, one of the re things that I've looked at, of course, is quite often you read about... The standard problem of ghetto problem is poverty. You read about it quite a lot. And um, I was... Uh, when I was looking at... I, I, I pronounced his name wrong, but Morgan Johansson, the, the guy who um, stopped the, um, um, the declaration of statistics, I was trying to find out why he did that. So I looked up and he spoke in a parliamentary debate last year. And he basically says, look, we already know that ethnic minorities are overrepresented in crime. We don't need to go back to that. Again, lumping all ethnic minorities together together. And and he said, but we also know that it's to do with the economic conditions in which they are brought up. 
So, by the way, this is a quite a straightforward narrative. We all know about that. Elvis Presley wrote a song about it in 1969. You know, um, that if you are if you are born in poverty and desperation, you might guy, as Elvis puts it, steals a car, finds a gun, but doesn't go far. You know, that is, in many cases, it is actually the case. So when you look at studies of American poverty, American gangland crime, you do find people born in a trap of poverty, which they struggle because they can't see any legitimate roots out of society. Um, and so the, the big question is, is that is the case, as Morgan Johansson was suggesting in Sweden? Is it simply a reflection of the conditions? Now, to, I, when I was reading SVD about the various places in Stockholm where this happens, I read a lot about Husby, about Rickaby, and so I thought I'd go to um, Rickaby a few days ago, where I went uh, along, um, and I have to say, it's beautiful. I mean, you know, I, until it, I was, I'm not quite sure what I expected. I've been to sort of what you might call welfare ghettos in Glasgow, in Leicester. I made a documentary about poverty for Channel 4 a few years ago. When you go to these places, in the British context, you can see alcohol shops with men coming out. Obviously, you've got addiction problems. You can see the traces of drug addiction everywhere. Um, now, when I went to... I, I was only there for a while. You can't exactly visit gang crime. That's not something you can go and see. But um, I spoke to a bunch of boys in the corner. They were incredibly polite. They all spoke good English. One of them goes to international English school. Um, you know, that's a pretty good school. I wish there was one of those um, near me. My wife went to one of those. Um, he says he's going to be studying economics when he grows up. Um, and then, uh, I, I said, okay, obviously these guys are atypical, so I went to wander around. Now, other things which jump out of my British eyes, I couldn't see any graffiti, no litter, no sort of broken windows or any sort of signs of disorder that you might get in the Glasgow and the Leicester places. So I looked upon a study, which um, from 2021, by this guy, Amir Sari Aslan, now in Oxford, where he did find out there was a link between poverty and... Um, and crime, but once you adjust for ethnic factors, that disappears in the Nordic context. Now, that's quite interesting. I'm not quite sure how he adjusted for ethnic factors and kept his job in this environment, but he's now <laughs> um, in Oxford anyway. So, um, now, I also met, to help me, this guy, um, Mustafa Panshiri. I'm sure most of you will know who he is. Now, just meeting him, sort of, he embodies what Sweden gets right. A guy who came as a refugee from Afghanistan at the age of seven, served as a policeman, working with the kids, is now um, helping, doing what he can. And he was explaining to me what's happening in Stockholm. He was saying, if you go to Berlin, then sure, you're going to find gangsters, drugs, criminals, but it's all organized there because the Turkish mafia have got one quarter, the Albanians have got another one. That's organized crime. In Stockholm, there's disorganized crime. <laughs> So you've got these kids wondering, to, to fire a gun in Berlin, you need somebody's permission. It has to be, you know, the, the b big boss will come after you. In okay. Sweden, there's not that kind of thing. So I can't say that I got very far in my mystery of, um, to find out what is happening here. But I was struck by the kind of reluctance to ask questions and the extent to which culture can work. Now, when I, you know, when I met Mustafa, I thought to myself, this is you know, the kind of Sweden that I've got faith in. This is why I think this is the best small country in the world. And this ultimately will be the solution, which I'm sure you guys will find. But in my outsider's opinion, not until people learn to talk about the problem, frankly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Much to think about. <laughs> when your readers read about these stories, mm. are they surprised? Are they surprised that this has happened in Sweden? And what kind of array of explanations do they try to find out? Well, they are surprised that these just staggering scenes are, are happening in a country which is, until 10 years ago, known for its safety and tolerance. But, but let's take, I'll give you one story, a new story, every line of which would stagger a British audience. A guy comes to, asylum seeker comes to Sweden, seeks citizenship, while he's waiting, decides to take some part-time work as a hitman. Amazing. Number two, kills the wrong guy in a gym. Amazing. Number three, goes on the run, but gets granted citizenship while he's on the run. Amazing. Number four, he gets caught, but given two years. Amazing. But number five... He gets, by a Swedish charger, he gets access to internet while he's there and phone calls. Nobody can take that away from him. So he decides to organize a jailbreak. Amazing. Number six, he says he's got toothache. So he gets driven to the dentist. 
Amazing. Where he meets his mates with armed guns, and then as the security guards are told that they can't respond when they see somebody with a gun. Amazing for somebody done for armed murder. So he doesn't even do two years and gets out. Now, when a British person is reading that, oh, every single element of that could only happen in Sweden. That's the feeling, rightly or wrongly. Has this generally, do you think, changed the image of Sweden? Is this sort it of the over, a, overriding is, thing? I wouldn't say it's overriding. I've still got friends who basically w w w come to Stockholm from like Kate Andrews and Katie Bowles, my economics editor and political editor. They come to Stockholm twice a year in a girls' trip just to have fun, right? People love Sweden. It has added a dimension to Sweden. And it has a, become a cautionary tale in what happens of laws that were created for a society at one state of homogeneity are not updated to adapt it to the multicultural reality which every European country is now in. Thank you this far. Okay. Elisabeth Braut, where are you? There at the back, as a backbencher, please come up front. That's my future, as a backbencher. <laughs> the question no. is, for which party? No. <laughs> <laughs> Perspectives not from as a backbencher, from, from the Middle East. From the Middle East. I'm, I think the reason I was asked to talk about the Middle East is because Sweden's most ambitious foreign, foreign policy, uh, or indeed a policy initiative uh, in recent memory, concerns the Middle East and has gone terribly wrong, which is the NATO application. And the question is, what went wrong? And uh, that goes back to, I think, the fundamental issue of diplomacy, which is what I want to talk about, and that is how you understand the other side. Because if you don't, under, if you don't understand the other side, yeah, there's actually one very senior diplomat here. I hope you say you agree with everything I say, because that would make it easy. Uh, if you don't understand uh, the other side, if you can't assess the other side, then you will, uh, your policy will immediately end in failure. And here's a really good example of that. Um, and it's from a, a fantastic BBC documentary about the first Gulf War, where uh, the producer managed to line up every single person uh, who was involved in any way, uh, from Margaret Thatcher to Tariq Aziz. And Tariq Aziz says in this documentary, uh, about the famous letter that uh, George Herbert Walker Bush sent to Saddam Hussein just before the invasion. Um, and in this letter uh, that uh, George Herbert Walker, Walker Bush sent to Saddam Hussein, he, dis he sent it with James Baker, Secretary of State, Ch State James Baker, to deliver ter to Tariq Aziz for uh, uh, then to be delivered to Saddam Hussein. And in this letter, uh, George Bush said, you better not invade Kuwait because America will punish you. And we have so and so many soldiers. We have so and so many weapons of different kinds. And by the way, we have nuclear weapons. And Tariq Aziz took this letter um, that uh, James Baker handed him and he read it. And he said, and he talks about this in the documentary, he said, Mr. Secretary, I have no doubt that your country is very powerful. And I have no doubt that your country can inflict great harm on our country. But we have existed for 6,000 years and will continue to exist even after you do what you intend to do. And uh, Saddam Hussein went on to invade Iraq. And I think that is such a powerful story because the American diplomats and, and advisors had completely failed to understand what motivated Saddam Hussein. And I think that is a, a very common foreign policy problem because we engage in mirror imaging. So we think of other countries, um, our diplomats think of other countries when they approach them, when they deal with them. They think that they operate on the same basis or according to the same considerations as we do. <coughs> so when Sweden thought about NATO membership, clearly somebody in the foreign ministry said, well, you know, how should we deal with or what should we tell the Turks? Uh, let's, let's bring up this point, that point, And if they say such and such, we'll say such and such. And, and that's what they did. And uh, 
uh, only to discover that actually the Turks had completely a completely different conversation in mind and uh, didn't think like them. But what went wrong was that there was nobody there clearly in the foreign ministry who had any sort of experience on the ground uh, in, in, for example, in, in Turkish society. And as you know, diplomats rotate in and out. And these days they often stay very much in the confines of, of their office because diplomacy can be very dangerous. Um, but clearly there was nobody really who had any, any sort of experience in, uh, in Turkish culture. And I'm not discrediting every single diplomat here, but something went wrong. And that something is something that uh, often goes wrong because the way the Swedish foreign ministry and in, indeed many other foreign ministries recruit diplomats is that it's very much a civil service position. Where if, if you think back to the history of diplomacy, it's full of personalities who were recruited uh, from the ground, you know, uh, adventurous types who were hired into diplomatic positions and did very well because they had an understanding of, of the country. Um, that is not so much uh, the case when you hire diplomats at a, at a young age and they go through the civil service training and so forth, rotate in and out and, and live the, the safe life of diplomats. And I think actually this is uh, an area where Sweden has room for improvement. Um, because this is how Swedish diplomats are recruited. And, and um, as somebody who has lived abroad uh, as an expat permanently since the age of 18, um, I've watched this in many, in sev well, in the countries, I've, different countries I've lived. And um, it's extraordinary, really, that there is so little effort made to, for example, reach out to... Um, expat Swedes who may live in, in, in a particular country. They are the best resource, I think, or uh, certainly a very easy to access resource because they are there, they often understand the country, and they are willing to contribute their insights and so forth. That really doesn't happen, and it's a big difference compared to other countries. So, for example, um, uh, in, in my various think tank capacities, I often had German diplomats come to me and say, well... Uh, such and such is visiting, can you meet with him? And I'll do that because they think, <coughs> uh, well, they, they know uh, I have a, a long-standing connection with Germany, so I'll, I'll meet with such and such, whoever the visiting official is. The Finns do it, the Norwegians do it, the Italians do it all the time, but Sweden doesn't do it. Uh, and that is really extraordinary. And it's, uh, it's really such a missed opportunity. And I used to think that, oh, maybe they just don't like me. But then over the years I discovered uh, it's just uh, uh, Swedish expats are a blind spot to Swedish diplomats. And it's a massive missed opportunity. Now, the, the best example of how to use local resources... By the way, does anybody want to guess which diplomatic service does it the best? <laughs> well, uh, in its own way, but among more democratic uh, countries, the Holy See, they are phenomenal, uh, uh, extraordinary. So they uh, not only have the nuncios in every single country who, of course, speak lots of different languages, not just English, but Latin, English, Latin, and the local language. Uh, they are the best diplomats out there. But these nuncios interact with local bishops who interact with, uh, who constantly have conversations with local priests, nuns, and so forth. They have the, the, the Holy See, as a result, has the best understanding of any country in the world, because, of course, the Roman Catholic Church is in almost any country in the world. That is something I think other countries can learn from, because, yeah, the, the, the local priests and nuns don't work directly for the Holy See, but they are happy to, to share whatever knowledge they have and whatever insights they have. And by the way, it's not just expats like me uh, who are in the sort of think tank community, public policy community, who could share uh, insights. It's the business community. If you think about Sweden in particular, fantastic uh, globe-spanning business community. Nobody ever consults them on, on insights about what's going on in different countries. It's not just in Sweden that's the case. Uh, it's in other countries as well. And uh, for example, I, uh, the, the UK government asked me to do a, a study on, on that issue for the UK and, and British companies. And, and it's a similar picture there. But nevertheless, Sweden is a small country, relatively small country, with a massive business community spread all over the world. That would be a fantastic resource. And with that, over. Mm. Good, thank you. Uh, how could this be done? We 
can't copy the example of the Holy See because we're not Catholics. <laughs> 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 Perish the thought that we could learn yeah, anything but, from but the how, Catholics. But how could, how could Sweden sort of use expats as an unofficial diplomatic force? Well, first of all, you need to locate them. And the Italians are very good at this. I mean, they have a whole section within the foreign ministry that sort of keeps track of where their expats are and, and keep, uh, they keep in touch with them. And, and that's the first thing to do. If you don't know who they are, how are you going to consult with them? Then, of course, uh, when it comes to uh, some more famous names, I mean, you, you, you just have to... Um, you just have to uh, invite, for example, business leaders. The only complication with that, and I, I know this from having done this work for, for the UK government, is that if you invite some business leaders, other business leaders will want to be invited and they can say, well, why are they being invited and not me? So you have to sort of figure out the, the legal issues of inviting some but not all for these conversations. I know a great number of Swedish experts who love to change gossip about well, how horrible Sweden has become. So <laughs> not, not, I don't think all of them would be good ambassadors? Well, they, they don't need to be ambassadors. They need to provide insight from the countries where they are based. Who knows how many good, how many Swedish business um. people are in Turkey who could have told the Swedish government, you know, when you go into these negotiations, consider this, this and this okay. and that. Okay.